We will now begin today by welcoming remarks from an uh, interim provost of DePaul Youth University, Dr. Salma Ganem. Dr. Ganem was professor and dean of the College of Communication. She has been serving as interim provost since 2019. Now I will turn over the virtual podium to Dr. Ganem. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm so happy to be here with you today to launch the very first event in the William J. Dugutis Women in Science and Health Lecture Series. This series makes a wonderful addition to our academic programming, and I'm grateful to the committee for organizing today's event. The timing for this new series is also excellent as we celebrate the 10th anniversary of the College of Science and Health. Congratulations to all of you on reaching this significant milestone. I would be remiss not to recognize our alumna sponsor, Dr. Linda Dugutis, who made this lecture series possible. Dr. Dugutis, we're extremely humbled by your generosity and dedication to DePaul. Thank you for your public service and for serving as an excellent role model for our students. We're really proud to call you one of our own. For nearly 125 years, DePaul has served a diverse community of learners. Our students are known for their tenacity, their ability to roll up their sleeves and get the job done. That's why here we do is such a popular phrase at DePaul. Yes, DePaul students have grit. We have a history of doers, of women specifically, breaking the glass ceiling. In fact, nearly 50 years ago, a DePaul professor and alumna became the first American woman to serve as chief scientist at an Antarctic research station. Mary Alice McQueenie was a professor of biology at DePaul and a world-renowned authority on krill. She started working on, reship, on research ships offshore in 1962. Eventually, in 1974, the National Science Foundation allowed her and a DePaul student to winter at the McMurdo Station in Antarctica, making them the very first women to do so. See what I mean by grit? That's DePaul. Instead of challenges, we see opportunities. While we've come a long way since the days when a woman scientist needed permission to spend the winter in Antarctica, there are still glass ceilings that need smashing. That's why I'm grateful for lecture series like this one to encourage and support our female students as they work toward a science and health related career. We're honored to have Dr. Lise Elliott serve as the inaugural speaker for the William de Gutes Women in Science and Health Lecture Series. Dr. Elliott, thank you for taking the time to share your wisdom and expertise with us. Thank you all again for joining us in today's lecture and thank you as always for everything that you do for DePaul. Thank you, Dr. Ganem. Next, Dr. Stephanie Dansbarns, Dean of the College of Science and Health at DePaul University, will give us an introduction to the William J. DeGutis Women in Science and Health Lecture, and also introduce Dr. Linda DeGutis, the sponsor of this lecture series. Dr. Dansbarns is an expert in cancer biology and has been serving as Dean of CSH since 2020. Now, Dean Dance Barnes. Greetings. I am Dr. Stephanie Dance Barnes, Dean of the College of Science and Health. And first, thank you so much, Provost Ghanem, for your remarks of welcome. I would also like to welcome each and every one of you to the inaugural William J. DeGutis Women in Science and Health Lecture Series an annual event sponsored by the College of Science and Health. Thank you to Dr. Jean Jean Kipp and the planning committee for putting together this event. You all should be so very proud of your work and effort. I congratulate you on a job well done. It must be noted that the college has a rich history of supporting women in science through lecture series stemming back to 2005 with the establishment of the GM LaDuke Women in, in Mathematics, Science, and Technology Annual Lecture Series, hosted at that time by the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. 
The purpose of the LaDuke Lecture Series was to honor the contributions of Dr. Jeanne LaDuke, Associate Professor Emeritus of the Department of Mathematical Sciences, who taught for over 30 years at DePaul and who conducted groundbreaking research on contributions of early 20th century women mathematicians in the US. Um, from 2005 to 2016, this series invited prominent scientists to share their expertise with the DePaul community. Jeanne LaDuke, who I've been told was in attendance this evening, graciously granted her permission for the renaming of this valuable series. Jeanne, thank you for your many contributions. The purpose of the newly renamed William J. DeGutis Women in Science and Health Lecture Series is to promote the accomplishments of women in the natural health sciences, as well as other closely related fields. This series provides us the unique opportunity to create scholarship and community among faculty, students, staff, and the public while reinforcing the importance of creating an equitable and inclusive environment in which women can be supported and acknowledged for the valuable innovations, ideas, and alternate perspectives that we bring to the table. This past week, the CSH held the Women in Science and Health Creating a Legacy panel discussion. This discussion was comprised of female faculty and staff from across the college. The panel members eloquently shared their diverse perspectives, inspirations, experiences, insights, and advice as professionals who have navigated and perhaps overcome challenges in their journey to achieve positive outcomes in science and health. One of the most impactful questions raised during the discussion was what each of the panelists felt they wanted their legacy to be. The topic of creating legacy just really stood out in my mind as I had been thinking about this event and preparing for it. During my various conversations with Dr. Linda DeGudis, who I had the pleasure of introducing today, it was clear to me what she believed her father's legacy to be. Her father being William J. DeGudis, a World War II veteran that worked at Ford Motor Company and for the U.S. Department of Interior Federal Water Pollution Control Administration for many years protecting our waterways. He instilled in his daughter, Linda, a love and passion for science and public service and it, it is the passion and love for science and service that has brought us here today. Linda, like her father, wants to ensure that the longstanding issue of the lack of representation of women in STEM is addressed by creating a sustained platform that encourages participation and highlights the successful research and service and achievements of women in STEM careers. And fortunate for us, the opportunity has come in the form of this impactful lecture series. It must be noted that Linda is a very, very accomplished woman in STEM. Linda is a proud DePaul alum and nationally recognized leader for her policy, advocacy, and work on initiatives focusing on prevention of violence and injury, in addition to suicide prevention and intervention. Most recently, she was appointed to a national committee to create policy and disseminate information on the COVID pandemic. This committee is the advisory group for the National Academy of Medicine, American Public Health Association, COVID-19 Conversations web webinar series. This series is focused on the science behind the strategies, prevention, initiatives, and interventions to prevent the spread of the coronavirus and mitigate its impact. Linda is an outstanding example of the caliber of graduate that CSH produces. Our graduates have the distinction of the decision character where they are uniquely equipped to engage, innovate, and make discoveries in science and health to serve or in service to others. This is because our graduates have learned to ask the hard questions, empathize with people whose experience and per perspectives may be different from their own, and to test ideas with science and rigor and trust that diverse minds working together have the ability to arrive at more creative solutions. This speaks to our amazingly talented students and alumni that are making a tremendous difference in the world we live in. This speaks to the many contributions of our dynamic women 
of science that represent the College of Science and Health. And this also speaks to the necessity to continue to support meaningful efforts such as this. Once again, I want to emphasize the importance of why we are all here today. And that, that is to acknowledge the legacy of William J. J. DeGudis and the sustained impact that he has had on Linda and through the reach of this lecture series, ultimately his impact on many other women in science as well. At this time, please join me on behalf of the college in thanking Dr. Linda DeGudis for her gift that supports the William J. DeGudis Women in Science and Health Lecture Series. I now turn the stage over to Linda for remarks. Thank you, um, Dean Dense Barnes, and thank you, Provost Gannam. And good afternoon, everybody, and I'm really glad you've joined us um, this afternoon. I'd like to thank uh, Ding Ding and the committee who have worked hard on planning this lecture and really, um, uh, really have brought this forward and spent a great deal of time pulling things together and, and setting this up. So I'm really happy to be able to sponsor this lecture series and to really encourage other women to go into science um, and to do things that will make a tremendous difference. Um, I think that DePaul, um, for me, was a place where um, there was always encouragement. There was always um, a sense that you could do what you wanted to do, um, but that you also had an obligation to do something for your community and to help others. And I think um, it's something that I had grown up with and I had gone to Chicago public schools um, and uh, you know, my dad was one of the people who really encouraged me. So you might wonder why I decided to um, do this and sponsor this in honor of my dad and what he did. Um, yes, he wasn't, he did not go to college, but he was very involved in science. And I finally realized that what he was involved in too was a real public health initiative and a lot of work in um, water pollution control at the time that the Great Lakes region was really suffering and some of the lakes were close to being dead, um, particularly Lake Erie at that time when um, the, one of the rivers that fed into it frequently caught fire. Um, so we had many discussions about those kinds of things at home over the dinner table. Um, and even before he had started to work for the um, EPA, um, we talked a lot about science and about education. And he always emphasized how important education was. Um, he, like I said, he graduated from Chicago Public Schools. He um, did not go to college, but he did have this great opportunity um, to work on water pollution control. And the other thing that he did was he's volunteered a lot. Um, he spent a lot of his time with the American Legion because he was a veteran. He wanted to help people in active duty and other veterans. Um, he coached the drill team, the girls drill team there. Um, and he, just always stayed active with um, both the American Legion and with um, with kids, with trying to do things for kids. Um, so he encouraged me, he always encouraged me and always told me that girls could do anything. Um, one of his, one of the things he always did was made sure that um, I knew how to use various tools that he had on his workbench in a very organized fashion, but um, I now, benefit from all of that. He always um, took me and my sister fishing, but told us that we couldn't fish unless we could bait the hook ourselves. So he made, you know, it wasn't that you're a girl, you can't do that. It was that you need to do that. Um, and I remember before I even was allowed to get my driver's license that I had to prove that I could check the oil, um, change a tire and uh, charge the battery if necessary. So um, he also participated in education. He supported all of my science experiments that I did um, from growing algae in the basement um, to catching animals. Um, I had a little pet frog for a while. I had a chemistry set and he would bring me specimens that the lab was discarding like um, a lamprey eel that used to sit on the shelf in the basement near the laundry area, um, which absolutely petrified my mother. Um, but he also took me to visit 
the labs at his job and and encouraged me to talk to the people working there. And there were a number of women who worked there who were doing the research, they explained things. And so um, I did learn a lot about science and the ideas that women could do science and could enjoy doing it. Unfortunately, um, my dad died when I was a junior at DePaul. So he didn't get to see some of the other things that I've been able to do, but he did, um, he did get to see me go to school there. He knew I would finish and he just encouraged me in my education. And what I learned from him, I think the, the key things are that education is important, that your values and principles are important, that giving back is important and that you can do whatever, whatever you think you can do. He would have never expected to have a lecture series named after him, but it's truly a series that he would support as it really reinforces what he thought, that girls and women can do anything, that um, we can break the glass ceilings, that science is important, and that there are no limits to what we can do to make the world a better place. So thank you for coming, and I really encourage you to stay involved and interested in science. And I'll turn it back over to Jingjing. Thank you, Dr. Degutis. It was uh, wonderful to hear about your father and your upbringing in Chicago. Uh, these stories are truly inspirational to us all. As uh, pointed out by Dr. Scanning and uh, Dan Sparns, uh, one of the purposes of the lecture series is to promote the accomplishments of women in the natural and the health sciences. We will hear more about the accomplishments of today's keynote speaker later. But prior to that, we would also like to highlight the accomplishments of some of our female students. The College of Science and Health has created female-centered scholarships for a number of years. Today, I am excited to announce the most recent recipients of the scholarships. Lauren Abel's Charles was a junior from the Department of Biological Sciences, majoring in neuroscience. She's the 2020 recipient of a Confati scholarship. Marianne Sheep is a senior from the Health Science Department and majoring in bioscience. She's the 2020 recipient of the Leopold Scholarship. The purpose of these two scholarships are to encourage female students enrolling and excelling in science, math, and health, and to increase the diversity of the student population in the sciences at DePaul University. Congratulations to Marianne and Lauren. We are very proud of you. Next, we will have Dr. Dorothy Kaslaski introduce our keynote speaker. Dr. Kaslaski is a Vincent DePaul Professor of Biological Sciences and Neuroscience. Here is uh, Dr. Kaslaski. Good afternoon, or almost evening, everyone. Um, I'm really pleased to have the privilege of introducing our speaker today, Dr. Lise Elliott. I first met Lise when we were both working at the um, with the Chicago Society for Neuroscience. And I have had the pleasure and fortune of calling her a friend and a colleague since then. Dr. Elliott is Professor of Neuroscience and Executive Chair of Foundational Sciences and Humanities at the Chicago Medical School of Rosalind Franklin. She received her BA in History um, and Science from Harvard University then went on to complete a PhD in cellular physiology and biophysics from Columbia University. After completing her doctoral degree, she went on to com uh, complete a postdoctoral fellowship in the Division of Neuroscience at Baylor College of Medicine. Dr. Elliott has published more than 60 peer-reviewed publications and two highly praised books. She has been interviewed over 300 times for television, film, radio, and print, including Good Morning America, The Wall Street Journal, and the BBC. Dr. Elliott studies how the innate biology, sociocultural factors, and individual experience work together to mold our brains and our behaviors. Her research is centered on brain and gender development, especially the role of neuroplasticity, which is the ability of the brain to change, in shaping neural circuitry and behavior. She is a champion 
for supporting and fostering the careers of women in science and health, which is why I think it's only fitting that she be our inaugural speaker for this renewed lecture series. Her talk today is entitled On the Origins of Gender, Brain Sex Differences, Neuroplasticity, and Women's Advancement in STEM. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Elliott. Thank you so much, uh, Dorothy, and um, all these illustrious uh, people today, Provost Ghanem and Dean Dance Barnes and Dr. Kip and, uh, and especially Dr. DeGudis. Um, I'm truly honored to be your inaugural speaker. I think I was supposed to do this a year ago. <laughs> and as we all know, our, our lives have been shifted forward a year. So I'm so happy that you were able to make this happen and very honored that it's uh, coincident with your 10th anniversary. Uh, and also just wanted to congratulate uh, Lauren and Miriam on the scholarships. That's, um, you know, every little bit uh, we can do to foster women in science, I think will be good for science, good for women and good for humanity. So that is uh, my theme today. Um, let me make sure I pull up the right screen. Uh, Hopefully you've got a full size view of my title slide. If not, somebody jump on and holler at me. Um, so I have rather an ambitious agenda today, uh, but I promise I won't keep you all night. <laughs> we will finish on time. Um, and I just wanted to say a word about my title on the origins of gender. I actually started as a history of science major um, and uh, wrote and read and thought all about Darwin for basically four years and was particularly uh, focused on the influences on his theory, how he was a man of his time, both scientifically and culturally, that led to, uh, of course, his great theory, but also some more dated ideas he had, for example, about women. Um, and uh, I'd, I'd like to you know, be so bold as to think that we can get at the, at the understanding of this this complicated thing called gender, which is, as you'll see, quite a bit different uh, from uh, sex. So I'm going to try to tie this into my uh, area of expertise, which is neuroscience and the way in which claims about women's brains and minds have um, been used to uh, hold women back um, and need to be battled with uh, equally uh, strong science. Can advance. And so just for the fun of it, we're going to start with uh, something that some of you may have seen before, um, really cut to the chase about everything you need to know about the science of sex difference as told by the legendary Ron Burgundy. So uh, if you're not familiar, this is a clip from the film The Anchorman starting, starring Will Ferrell with uh, Christina Applegate and Ferrell plays this blowhard anchorman. Um, in back in the 70s, who's uh, threatened by the first woman uh, um, newscaster, maybe it was in the 80s, actually, uh, the first woman newscaster uh, to come to their station. And she's caught him in, um, in a sort of compromising situation. So she says, what kind of man are you? And he tells her quite forcefully. Ah, try that again. I'm a man who discovered the wheel and built the Eiffel Tower out of metal and brawn. That's what kind of man I am. You're just a woman with a small brain, with a brain a third the size of us. It's science. So uh, kind of in a nutshell, that's what it's all about. Uh, anytime uh, women need to be put in their place, we'll just pull, pull out their brains and measure them up and, and uh, tell them why they're not cut out for science or newscasting or whatever. But <laughs> um, obviously, it's a comedy. It's actually a pretty good movie if you've never seen it. Uh, and this notion about men have bigger brains than women. Yes, indeed, they do. And that you know has been extrapolated in all these horrible ways. Cut to the chase, uh, brain size is proportional to body size. And so it really is not a meaningful thing. But um, people have had to justify sexism since going back to Aristotle was the first one to comment on women's brains. 
And, um, and so here uh, is just a perfect example um, dating back about 160 years ago, 180 years ago. Uh, Gustave Le Bon, a French, um, you know, uh, Renaissance man who was in, into, into science and humanities. And he invented this portable cephalometer, fancy name for measuring your head. And he used it to declare, measured up a bunch of people to declare that women represent the most inferior forms of human evolution. Of course, this was the era of evolution. And um, uh, so we had to be put in our place then. And you'd like to think that uh, this had ended back in the 1800s, maybe even the mid 1900s, uh, maybe even the late 1900s. But in fact, uh, even the 21st century, uh, we've got plenty of neurosexism, as it's been called, still alive. That is using neuroscience to to uh, make sexist claims about women and their abilities. So here's just a few headlines from Forbes. Is equal opportunity threatened by new findings that female and male brains are different? Um, um, the science on male and female brains helps explain why women don't choose tech careers. Uh, so anytime a paper is published about a brain sex difference, there's somebody that likes to jump on and, and use it to explain uh, these persistent gaps we have in society. And then, of course, many of you will have uh, come across the Google memo um, published by a, uh, or not published, it was an internal memo to Google, uh, but it's a big company and it leaked out, uh, written by James Damore, who was a software engineer at the time, and um, subsequently was let go for his uh, statements about um, basically women's innate inferiority as programmers deriving from testosterone and our neuroticism and a bunch of other uh, liabilities. So, um, you know, that's kind of the popular take, although as I think you can see, it actually has uh, deep tendrils into real life um, status of women in science. If we cut to the academy, um, the uh, study and interest in, in brain sex differences is, is is very deep. There's, uh, you know, it's still a huge area of research, and um, it's approached from different ends of the academic spectrum. So, here we see what uh, a, a, another Catholic university, in this case in Spain, uh, the, in their bioethics observatory, takes a great interest in sex differences in the brain and mind. So here you see a headline from 2017: Two sexes, two minds. You know, two types based on scientific evidence. It's just like Will Ferrell. Uh, it's science. Um, and then again, a couple years later, once again, scientific evidence proves significant differences between the brains of men and women. And we can actually see them um, uh, illustrated here, this, this firework of uh, emotional brain in a notably smaller head than this very logical uh, larger uh, male brain. So, uh, you know, this is really driving a lot of the not just science, but it, it really underlies a lot of sociological uh, theories as well. And then we, we also have sort of at another extreme in, uh, in research, there's a, a very strong women's health movement. And um, of course, you know, there's no question that there have been many health disparities. We'll talk about a few of them. And uh, women's bodies have been understudied by researchers. But it turns out women's brains really haven't been that understudied, as I'll show you. We have tons and tons of research on women's brains, and yet this uh, persistent notion that there is such a thing as a female brain and a male brain, and that these are going to be very important for um, gender differences in, in, in psychiatry and neurology, uh, is really fueling a lot uh, of research, and in some ways, as I hope to show you, is providing an inaccurate perception of, of uh, our true brain sex differences. So here I've tried to whet your appetite with what I think of as the million dollar questions. And there's two reasons they're the million dollar questions, uh, literally because um, millions and millions of grant dollars have been spent uh, comparing male and female brains, uh, you know, primarily at the MRI level. But to me, the million dollar questions are really, to what degree are any brain differences we find a product of sex, meaning, you know, as, as we'll define raw biological genes, hormones, 
or are they a product of gender? As, as Dr. Kozlowski mentioned, I study neuroplasticity and uh, our gender roles uh, inevitably will affect the way we use our brains and the way our brains wire up, which is kind of the second theme of this talk. And so for me, the million dollar question really is how can brain development inform us about the emergence of of all these dimensions of gender, our behavior, our expression, and our identity. So what I'll take you through in this talk are first very simply defining sex versus gender, which is going to be familiar to any of you who've taken a, uh, a gender studies or women's studies classes, but unfortunately not everybody does. And, um, and biologists who are interested in this topic often don't fully understand the difference. And then we'll cut to what are uh, some of the very well described from psychology uh, gender differences in in behavior and psychological traits. As well as the gender dis disparities in uh, in in social roles and status uh, which aren't necessarily directly tied to these psychological differences. And then um, I will take you to my own research, which is focused on uh, brain sex comparisons, which I hope you will appreciate indicate way, 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 way more similarity than difference. I, I really am going to battle this notion of dimorphism and try to convince you that the human brain is a mono, a sexually monomorphic uh, uh, organ. And then uh, with as much time that allows, we will uh, talk about how uh, brain development can inform us about gender development and particularly about the development of uh, abilities in STEM. So um, many of you are going to be familiar with this, but for those who don't fully understand the difference between sex and gender, sex is a biological attribute and it is basically binary, although not perfectly, roughly 1% of individuals have uh, a combination of genes, chromosome, or genes, hormones, and gonads that put them somewhere in between uh, typical male and typical female. Uh, but we can think of sex for our purposes primarily biolo as, as biological and binary, and some people refer to it as 3G when we're talking about the role of just genes, genitalia, and gonads. Gender, on the other hand, refers to the psychosocial attributes that are typical for males or females or considered appropriate um, based on one's culture. And of course, these change through time and, and locale. Every dimension of gendered behavior, identity, expression actually exists on a non-binary spectrum. There is no dividing line uh, on the different dimensions of gender. Even something like sexuality, as we know, uh, uh, one can be attracted to the same sex, the other sex, or various degrees in between. So um, gender differences in behavior have been studied for uh, much longer than gender differences in the brain, at least at, at a rigorous level um, in psychology. And yes, it's absolutely the case that men and women differ on many psychological measures. But as Janet Hyde and later Ethan Zell uh, have demonstrated, uh, the vast majority, about 85% of, of psychological traits are uh, very, very small differences. So if we think of the sex difference in height, which, you know, is about five inches on average, um, pretty noticeable, not absolute, of course, there's some overlap. We need to quantify these things. And we use a very simple statistic, the D statistic that um, uh, basically compares the two means and divides it by a pooled standard deviation. And a difference on this scale, a D value of 2.5 is considered a very, very large difference. And contrast that to all of the, almost all the psychological differences uh, in uh, sex differences. And these, as, as Hyde and Zell separately showed, the vast majority are smaller than a D value of 0.35. And um, note by this uh, convention, when a female's, female group scores higher than a male group, um, the convention has been to call that a negative uh, uh, D value, although I, I don't necessarily adhere to that. Now, there are a handful of things, a uh, handful of sex differences that are larger than this very small effect. And the point I think you can see is that there's tremendous overlap, uh, very little basis for predicting for an individual where they're going to fall in these curves. Um, but there are a few differences that are larger spatial skills, which um, are important for uh, STEM and as I hope to point out, 
uh, are an opportunity for uh, increased um, increased representation uh, of, of everybody. We don't do enough to train spatial skills, but um, each of these differences, physical aggression, tender-mindedness, importantly, are basically absent in young children. And these differences emerge with growth and development. And so I would argue are very strongly shaped by, by family and culture. Um, of course, there are bigger differences when we get to kind of the tail of the curve. When you get to, out to the end, there may be less overlap, and that is generally thought to be the basis for why we have these more dramatic two to one ratios, for example, in, in dyslexia and, and depression. Um, but in addition, I just want, and I'm just going to plant this, this, um, this little seed and we can maybe talk about it later. Even some of these dramatic differences in mental, in, uh, in various psychiatric disorders like autism, three or four to one, boys to girls, probably has a contribution from diagnostic bias. And uh, almost every one of these, I think we can find some evidence that clinicians are, are biased to see autism in boys or depression in women. Um, but there is also likely a cultural role for many of these things. And I'll just point out eating disorders, for example, there's about a three to one ratio overall, higher prevalence in, in women, and it's 10 to one if we just consider an, uh, an, anorexia nervosa, but very clear evidence that that is a function of one's cultural uh, environment. You see a lot of variation from culture to culture. So we really need to distinguish between some of these uh, differences versus uh, the, the disparities that uh, arise less from sex and more from one's social role. So there's no question that across uh, societies, there's only been a, a rare uh, few societies that have violated these disparities where men tend to have higher uh, status, higher wealth, higher pay, uh, more prestigious occupations, um, and certainly do much less unpaid domestic work. And many of these factors are associated with some of those uh, psychiatric disorders that we that I showed in the previous slide. For example, uh, uh, one's financial security is a strong influence over whether one develops depression or not. And uh, of course, women are poorer than men. So just to plant a seed of some of these, or, or dementia, uh, turns out um, individuals who have a lot of caregiving experience, caregiving for someone with dementia end up likelier to be diagnosed with dementia. So there's a lot of um, uh, factors in addition to just sex that may influence some of those diagnostic differences. And another uh, idea to ruminate about as we look at some of these uh, brain sex findings is that many of the things that we refer to as sex differences in behavior, again, really uh, may amount to status differences. So for example, women smile more than men. There's no difference in children before the age of five or so in, in how much boys and girls smile. But um, you know, there's um, more expectation that women smile. And I also should point out that those with lower status are likelier to smile. If you think of uh, the prisoner versus the prison guard, it's pretty clear who's going to be smiling at who in order to, um, to get better treatment. Um, neuroticism, you know, those who are smaller are, are uh, going to be more fearful, perhaps, and uh, likelier to express uh, more neuroticism, which is one of the things that females score higher on. And I also want to point out that these status disparities begin in childhood even before puberty and um, are probably a, a result of, of social learning. So, you know, uh, if you think of names, there's I've got a few new babies in my uh, among my friends and family. And uh, the names given to some of the girls, Rory is one, Parker is another, uh, are names that used to be given to boys, but um, names will transition from, from uh, boys to girls, like Lindsay and Ashley used to be boys' names, but never the other way. And that's because it would threaten the boys' expected higher status to uh, do that, whereas you can elevate the girls' status. Um, Boys are punished for cross-gender, for, for playing like girls. Girls are rewarded for being uh, tough and athletic. And as we'll see, um, children 
as young as six already understand these status differences and are, both boys and girls are likelier to grant um, the term brilliant or really smart or uh, to a man than a woman or even a, a, a peer boy versus girl. So all of that um, is underlying uh, uh, many of these sex differences. And um, alas, are also contributing to what we know as this uh, sadly leaky pipeline of women in STEM. So um, I'm sure uh, DePaul, like many universities, is, is seeing a, a dramatic uh, increase in the number of women enrolled in most undergraduate science majors. We're at least 50-50 in many fields more in, in biology. But as we know, as we go up the ranks, um, these numbers fall off for many, many reasons um, that I hope to convince you have nothing to do with uh, women's innate brain potential. So that will be the question for the next uh, portion of this talk. Do brain sex differences explain gender disparities? Um, I've already kind of set you up for this, but I really want to arm you with the evidence because there's so many claims about brain sex difference. And, and frankly, they are not uh, large and they're surprisingly unreliable uh, in humans. So first of all, I want to dispense with this term uh, dimorphism. This is um, a very sciencey sounding way of, of saying difference or, but properly defined dimorphism means two different forms like you know, antlers on, on a male deer and lack of antlers, or like the difference between testes and ovaries, uh, clear structural shape differences, um, classic being the peacock's tail versus the peahen without that beautiful tail. Um, and so in, um, in neuroscience, this is the search for brain sexual dimorphism has been uh, fervent uh, over my career and even predating that. Um, but it, it, it began from a pretty honest place. Um, studies in other species in which uh, behaviors are really much more dramatically different than they are in humans led to the discovery of certain parts of the brain that uh, are dramatically different in, in one sex than the other. So here we show a couple of zebra, finch, zebra finches, and these are songbirds where only the male sings the courtship song. The females do not learn or sing the courtship songs. And so it turns out, research by uh, Fernando Notobaum and Art Arnold beginning in the, in the 70s, found that there are various structures in the brain, in the striatum, part of the forebrain, that are dramatically larger in males than females. There's also some areas larger in females than males, but this is looking at nucleus RA, which is actually like six times larger in males than females. And so that is where the definition of dimorphism came from. And But it just sounds so sciencey that instead of saying a sex difference or a sex effect, biologists love to use this term sexual dimorphism. So if it's one thing I can inculcate, uh, uh, communicate to the biologists in the group is please don't use sexual dimorphism unless you're talking about two distinct forms. Otherwise, it's a sex difference or a sex effect. And yet we see all these these titles about sexual dimorphism of EEG signals or or um, autistic features or I mean, these are things that are probably just statistical differences that are not two two shapes at all. So. When uh, I published just this winter um, a study with uh, several wonderful medical students where we tried to do a complete synthesis of uh, the human brain sex imaging literature over the past 30 years, which is how long we've been doing MRI studies of the brain. Um, I decided to title it Dump the Dimorphism because uh, everything we find uh, fails to support this notion that there's anything in the human brain that is two shapes, that is even twofold uh, difference. As we'll see, the difference is extremely subtle, more like 1% uh, differences, if that. And if you don't want to read this ridiculously long paper, um, if you happen to be on Twitter, I I composed a, a, a tutorial with uh, 20, 25 sequential tweets that will give you the whole paper and all the figures and hopefully will be much more digestible. And then if you really want digest, di, di, digested, here's the uh, conclusion of our study. Basically, if the null hypothesis is that uh, there is no difference, then 
the null hypothesis is winning at this time. I claim that the sexual, the human brain is not sexually dimorphic or even meaningfully different in any of these specific measures of structure or activation. First of all, regional brain volumes of uh, specific either cortical or subcortical structures. The thickness of the cerebral cortex often claim to be larger in females, but this is, does not hold up across many uh, the multiple of studies. Lateralization, the degree to which um, women or men use one or the other hemisphere at a time uh, has long said to be different. Uh, men are said to be more lateralized, again, uh, not supported by the plurality of data. And the fMRI studies claiming different brain activations, different areas lighting up in men and women when we do different tasks wholly unsupported uh, by meta-analyses, um, as well as some data I won't have time to get to, including the connectome and, uh, and neonatal brain. So first, let's look at structural MRI. There have been um, hundreds of studies uh, comparing men and women. Um, and it's so easy to do, because now we have these large databases, and anybody can um, go back to these published uh, MRI data and um, sort them by sex. And if you're lucky, you get a, an extra paper. So there's, there's a lot of data fishing that's gone on. And here's one of the largest of these studies, 5,000, more than 5,000 subjects in, uh, done in the UK, uh, claiming to uh, find these definitive differences between males and females. Well, as I, as I already alluded to, and, and Ron Burgundy told us, men have larger brains than women. That's the blue curve versus the pink curve here. Um, uh, but it is a function of head size. It's correlated with height, but it's better correlated with, with, with uh, head size properly. Um, and we see that uh, it's true for the total brain, for the gray matter, and for the white matter. However, and you see it across every structure with effect sizes um, on the order of uh, a D value about 1.0 or you know, 0 0.8, 0 0.7. However, the proper uh, way to do morphometry brain measurements is always, whether you're looking at sex, whether you're looking at age, whether you're looking at disease, always you always correct for what we call intracranial volume or basically total head size and when we do that you see that all of these differences go away and what remains is an extremely small differences in a very small handful of studies of structures the amygdala interestingly they found no difference in the hippocampus but you see the effect sizes we're now down to 0 0.18 0 0.12 and i think the curves illustrate better so with um my uh another group of students we actually did meta-analyses using all this published data, looking at two structures in, in particular, the hippocampus, which has long been said to be larger in women and account for uh, female advantage in verbal memory, and the amygdala, which is very often stated to be larger in males and perhaps, you know, wave your hand, it, it explains difference in, in aggression, um, uh, you know, lots of things. Yeah, I guess aggression is the main one that's been pinned on amygdala volume. Well, it turns out um, from when we gather these dozens of studies looking at thousands of participants, um, the difference in the human hippocampus, which is this green structure here, is all of 0.6% in volume. Uh, once we normalize everybody's hippocampal volume to their own head size, which I said is the is what you have to do when you're doing any kind of individual comparison. And it was not uh, statistically significant. The amygdala, all of 1% different. And so the effect sizes of these are uh, quite small D values, uh, well below, well into the, in the small range or trivial range. And if you wanna see what that looks like, if, if that was our sex difference in empathy, you see the difference in the uh, hippocampus here, uh, pretty much over superimposed curves. Um, hippocampal volume is absolutely not uh, dimorphic nor even statistically different in our analysis. So what we did in our recent review was collect all of these studies that have looked at various, this, in this case, subcortical. I know this is really small, you can't see this, but it's like caudate, putamen, pallidum, et cetera. Only looking at um, large and highly cited studies. And I hope with this pink and blue and yellow map 
shows you is that the consistency is extremely poor. Although uh, a, a few studies find larger amygdala in males, you see many, many studies don't. And when I, you saw how small the effect is, if it's only a 1% volume difference, it's not that surprising. It's not turning up in every study. Um, and so these are not uh, species-wide differences. They're, they're population-specific differences. Same thing for cortical volumes. Um, if you just look, and this is from that same study out of the UK with 5,000 participants, every part of the cortex is larger in males in raw volume. That's why it all looks blue. But when you control for total brain volume or total intracranial volume, you see it basically goes to no difference, very small differences, a few gyri that are different, uh, maybe like 15% of gyri were different, and the effect sizes are all extremely small, less than 0.22. And that was just one study that was just Ritchie. If when we, these are all the largest studies that we accumulated, ranging from, you know, 300 to 5,000 participants. And looking at each of the different major zones of the cerebral cortex, frontal lobe, parietal, temporal, et cetera. And I think once again, hopefully you, you can look back at this from a distance and appreciate that the consistency is extremely poor. So one paper will claim, you know, we've got this difference in the orbital frontal cortex, but it won't be reproduced across all populations. So to me, that tells me that the sex difference is smaller than, um, than the general noise of brain structural volumes. I told you cortical thickness is often said to differ between males and females. So thickness, remember the cortex is this bark that sits over. We're looking at a coronal section through the brain right now. And the thickness of the cortex is about, you know, maybe two to four millimeters across different areas. It's um, been claimed from MRI studies to be larger in females, which is what some of these pink pink boxes show, but it's also been found in some studies to be larger in males. What's interesting to me is that the, the most rigorous measures done um, under the microscope with um, post-mortem studies, so these are smaller samples, but very accurate. You can measure much more precisely under the microscope than you can with the low resolution MRI. These histological studies found uh, no significant difference. If anything, it's slightly larger, all of a tenth of a millimeter thicker in males. So there's a huge inconsistency. And a lot of this variation from MRI to MRI study actually turns out to be a function of imaging uh, methodology, the processing pipeline and the particular segmentation software that's used. So sex, uh, cortical thickness does not vary. What about this left-right difference? We often hear um, as I said, that um, according to uh, this website, which is trying to draw you into um, all girls schools based on claims about brain sex difference, men use only one hemisphere at a time, but women employ whole brain thinking. So here's an example of uh, one older small study that found this, that women showed activation of both right and both left and right hemispheres during a language task. Men in this study, or at least the three brains they're showing us here, tended to show more left dominant. However, after this, there's been meta-analyses and many other studies that have failed to uh, find this universally. Um, in our case, we looked at the all the studies that look at the connections between the two um, hemispheres of the brain, namely the corpus callosum shown here in green, and the anterior commissure, this little bit shown in yellow that actually is kind of Here's a little neuroanatomy lesson, a kind of a um, mustache shaped structure that extends from one temporal lobe to the other. You're just seeing it in cross section here. Anyway, it turns out from all the lot from the largest studies that we collected, as well as meta analyses, I'm not showing there is no reliable uh, difference in the corp in the size of the corpus callosum, nor in the size of the anterior commissure. And uh, even more definitively, there was a recent review published in 2019 by Marcus Hausman and his group that uh, did a very similar synthesis as we are only focused on this lateralization issue. And so you see that the effect sizes are extremely small in terms of sex difference in, in, um, uh, uh, in who's using the left versus right hemisphere for a particular task or one hemisphere versus both. Effect size is 0 0.06, 0 0.01. And I just need to read their conclusion because they were particularly trying to test this hypothesis that differences in lateralization 
uh, contribute to cognitive differences between men and women, verbal addition, math or spatial differences. They conclude sex differences in hemispheric asymmetry are certainly not the driving force between behind sex differences in cognitive function. And I love this one line from their discussion. Our hope is that the present paper represents the metaphorical final nail in the coffin for this hypothesis that men and women are uh, differently lateralized. The last, uh, or one of the last areas we looked at in our paper is um, uh, functional MRI. This is, of course, brain areas that activate when you're doing a particular task. And since verbal and spatial skills are the largest cognitive differences, we looked at those. I, I don't have time to show you, but basically nothing reproducible across that. I will show you um, the um, meta-analyses of emotion processing because there's actually been seven prior uh, meta-analyses, six prior uh, meta-analyses of uh, emotion processing, and they're all finding different things. So some are finding uh, stronger activation in males, that's blue. Others are finding stronger activation in females. Some are finding no differences. So pick whatever meta-analysis you want to make your point. But the point is, if they can't reproduce from one meta-analysis to the other, it tells you that this is a very noisy method. And indeed, um, fMRI uh, studies of sex difference were pretty much totally debunked a couple of years ago, three years ago now, by Sean David in um, Iwanidi's group at Stanford. They uh, did a meta-analysis just focusing on fMRI, which is why, why we didn't do it, looking across various cognitive tasks. So uh, fMRI, as you know, or may not know, uh, is looking at, is ultimately measuring brain activity as a function of areas that increased blood flow during a specific task such as mental calculation or uh, a verbal you know verb generation task anyway what this um analysis shows is what you would predict this on the x-axis is the size of a particular study in number of participants and on the y-axis are the number of brain areas that were found to differ between males and females in functional activation and what the laws of statistics would predict is that as the study gets better, bigger, you have more power to find more brain areas that are significantly different. Um, so you would expect to see this red line. But in fact, what they found was no correlation. And if anything, the smaller studies were reporting bigger effects, which is classic sign of um, publication bias or the publication of false positive results, or in other words, a file drawer effect, that the, the negative results got, got filed away, never got published, and those research groups who found a sex difference were able to publish them. And the reason for that is simply that the sex differences are a heck of a lot sexier, if you will, than uh, the similarities. So uh, the last thing that we looked at was um, the newest twist on finding brain sex differences. You know, rather than looking at a single measure of hippocampal volume or amygdala volume, a lot of the proponents of brain sexual dimorphism say, well, you've got to look, you've got to integrate across all the variables and do this multivariate analysis. Every difference may be small, but when you put them together, uh, we still have a reliable signature of male and female brains. So there's now been at least a dozen, actually I found a couple more the other day, studies that have been able to use these huge data sets, you know, thousands of MRI or hundreds to thousands of MRI brain scans, put it into your artificial intelligence uh, algorithm, and the machine is able to pick up enough features that can discriminate male from female brains. And they're able to do it in this case, this particular study was only 67% accuracy with 50% being chance, but many of these other studies you can see up to 80, 90% accuracy. However, once again, they didn't correct for brain size. And it turns out that most of these um, architectural features of the brain, like the gray to white matter ratio are a function of size and not sex. And so when studies have actually controlled for uh, brain size, you see this prediction accuracy declined in some in some cases uh, almost down to chance to about sixty percent. So, so most of these these um, these so-called classification studies are really classifying brains based on size.
size, not sex. In other words, the differences that are discriminating men from women would also discriminate a large headed man from a small headed man. So let me then summarize this part of the talk that contrary to neuroscientists never ending faith, these larger as the studies are getting larger, we are not finally discovering these real brain differences. The differences themselves are extremely small, typically about 1% of volume difference and enormously variable across large data sets and I should say also across different ethnic groups. Um, sex related variation quite simply is swamped by uh, individual variation. And so please uh, um, disabuse yourself of this idea that there's such a thing as a male brain, female brain, or trans brain. And um, please, uh, instead of thinking of the brain as sexually dimorphic like the gonads, uh, I like to think of it as a monomorphic organ like the heart, the lungs, the kidneys, which importantly can be transplanted between men and women with with great success it's just another internal organ it is not like a reproductive organ and also important i like to point out that uh, a lot of women's health advocates uh particularly studying things like alzheimer's and depression believe that the women women's brains have been overlooked by research um and in fact going back 30 years, the data sets are completely representative of men and women. Women have not been excluded from this research. So at least in this sense, uh, um, it's not a function of a, a lack of study. So rather than um, diamorphic, uh, one of my colleagues, Daphne Joel, um, has used the term, you might think of the brain as being more intersex, although I think that may not be such a popular nomenclature with the intersection community. All right, so let me then just switch gears with the remainder of my little bit of remainder of my time and remind you that even if we did see reliable differences and at some level, of course, you've got behavioral differences at some level, there has to be a difference in brain, at least um, uh, activity or uh, connectivity. We haven't found it yet. But even if we find it, it doesn't prove that these are a function of sex or hardwired. So here's a little thought experiment for you. I've got two subjects in the scanner. We'll call one subject X, one subject Y, and we're doing a moral uh, reasoning task, a self-judgment task based on a scenario. And you see in this particular study, very strong activation in subject X in an area known as the medial prefrontal cortex or um, and then in subject Y, you see this little blip on the frontal pole. And so, of course, I'm deliberately misleading you into thinking that subject X is a woman and subject Y is a man when in reality, subject X was uh, raised as a Christian and subject Y was someone from the same uh, culture, but raised as a non believer. And the point of this is to illustrate how uh, cultural learning is at least as, uh, or gender learning has got to be at least as potent as other forms of cultural experience in shaping how our brains develop and ultimately function. So that's um, what I'd love to take another hour to tell you about, and I won't, I'll just kind of do a quick tour of brain development and the many ways in which experience that, that takes advantage of this plasticity, this malleability of the human brain is likely the main reason for why we have these gender uh, differences and disparities. So, you know, brain circuits are uh, connections of neurons and uh, their, their degree of connection, the strength of the connection is all a function of activity, of what experiences you've had uh, from the moment of birth, even from before birth. And so we have these, this slogan that cells that fire together, wire together, literally increase the number of connections. And if you don't lose it, if you don't use it, you will lose it or prune it back. We also have epigenetic modifications of the DNA that can, can produce lifelong changes in gene expression as a result of early experience, particularly early stressors have been shown to, to do that, adverse experiences. And even myelination, this um, dense fatty substance that makes the white matter and makes our neurons function very rapidly, uh, even that is, is a, 
uh, influenced by experience, by practice, by piano practice, as one study uh, showed. And this plasticity is far, far more potent in early childhood. So we really need to think about what kind of gender learning takes place early in development. Uh, we know from other, um, other neural systems that the plasticity is most potent when the number of synapses does this crazy Darwinian thing. We actually overproduce the number of synapses in different cortical areas creating the substrate for experience to select what will be the most useful. And many of you have probably heard about this uh, importance in the visual cortex when we have this excess number of synapses early in life, that's very, very important in, in order to uh, correct a child with a visual deficit. You must correct it during this critical period um, in order to restore vision to its full ability because uh, use it or lose it phenomenon with connections in the visual cortex. Um, other parts of the cerebral cortex undergo this pruning process more gradually. The frontal lobe, which participates in language, um, among other things, uh, has a much slower, uh, reaches its peak about four years of age and prunes towards the end of adolescence. And that happens to coincide with the critical period for language where we become less and less able to learn to master fluency as we take up a language later in life due to um, the loss of plasticity in these language parts of the brain. Well, what about gender development? Is there a critical period? And many, many um, clinicians and theorists have uh, hi um, hypothesized that there is a critical period that is less out of fashion now. Now people like to think that gender identity is hardwired at birth, but I think the real evidence, and I don't have time to go into it, but there actually is pretty good clinical evidence that gender is strongly influenced by, by, uh, by uh, the conditions of rearing. So, um, and I like to think of gender learning as very similar to language learning. There's a lot of mimicry, there's a lot of gesture, there's a lot of interpersonal communication that uh, goes into Gender learning, we know, of course, our language has different pronouns. We know that parents interact, uh, mothers um, um, begin to make more eye contact with their daughters and their sons. Uh, boys are treated more roughly and physically uh, from very, very early. And, and these differences, along with all the pronouns and the clothes, we reinforce gender very heavily. Uh, on top of that, children themselves play a major role in their own gender uh, development. They figure out the difference between male and female and they become very motivated to, um, to match the expected uh, rules for who wears barrettes and, and who um, you know, plays with trucks. And then of course the, the peer segregation uh, really enforces that once kids get to about three or four years of age and I just like to point out to all the parents who say, well, I don't, you know, I used to think that and then I, I had a son and, I, and a daughter and I saw how different they were so early and we treated them exactly the same. So it must be uh, all a matter of hormones and genes. Well, the truth is there is no gender free society on earth, just like there's no language free society. Um, these two languages of gender are present in every culture. It's only reinforced these days with all the gender reveal parties and everything. In many ways, it's gotten um, more uh, gender discriminatory than it used to be for the purple, pink, and blue for early childhood. And yet, we are seeing some of the uh, fluidity and plasticity of gender expression increasingly among uh, our young people and, and older people. I mean, it turns out gender transitions can take place at any time of life. It's not just this three-year-old declaring, you know, I'm the other gender. So um, I just, uh, if this is something you're interested in, I really can't more strongly recommend the work of Anne Fausto Sterling uh, from Brown. She's now emeritus at, uh, at Brown University. She's come out, this is um, a recent paper where she talks about this idea of uh, soft assembly. The idea of gender sex is a softly, not hard by wired but softly assembled dynamic system and there's uh analogies to other forms of learning like even learning how to walk it turns out is a dynamic process everything we do is uh is a mixture of um practice and iterative feedback and embodied habit uh, 
Um, and so, uh, you know, the, this general idea that of development, as you, you might have seen this in a developmental biology class, that differentiation is going down this slope of um, kind of driving us towards this, this potential outcome. But early on, probably for the first year or so, uh, children really are in an undifferentiated state and we provide the cues to them to help them find which trough is going to be uh, the easier route. But of course, not everybody finds the easier route and some have more difficulties. And I just wanted to point out, I went to a lecture um, on uh, uh, induced human pluripotent stem cells that show we're able to de-differentiate stem cells to turn a fibroblast back into an undifferentiated cell and then back into a neuron, for example. Um, you know, some of the gender transitions we're seeing at, in people at different stages of life actually kind of supports uh, this, this model. So um, just as a quick example of that, you know, children are pretty undifferentiated with their color preference, um, but by uh, once they discover their gender identity, and language is a big part of this, once they begin uh, identifying and able to talk about uh, gender itself, we see this uh, divergence and, and girls go through their pink frilly phase and boys develop this strong aversion. Uh, and this was an experiment done to counteract this notion that boys are hardwired to like blue and girls are hardwired to like pink. So everything has a gender in our culture, including um, a lot of things that pave the way towards a career in science. Um, what, what does this tell us that we have a real calculator versus a toy calculator or a 500x microscope in black for the boys and a 90x power uh, telescope for the girls? Here's the microscopes. Um, there are just a lot of cues along the way um, that are contributing to why this high status profession of STEM and medicine um, continues to exclude or uh, unconsciously uh, um, communicate that, that this is a field women are, are less uh, suited for. Um, so I will have to skip ahead um, to all these fun slides about who gets called brilliant. I'm sure you're familiar with the implicit association test that makes it easier for all of us to link science uh, words with male names and uh, liberal arts words with female names. The depressing thing is that children, even as young as age, I think this was as young as age six, um, already girls and boys uh, have an easier time linking boy names with math and girl names with reading, even though there is no difference in reading scores. There is no longer any difference in reading scores, both in the US and then even globally. Uh, and yet teachers uh, have internalized this idea that boys are better than math. And this was a great study out of, out of um, Israel that uh, found um, when you compared teachers' assessment or teachers' scoring uh, in the classroom versus scores that students took in a nationalized standardized exam, they found that the teachers were biased and were giving boys higher grades in math compared to the national standard exam. Um, and this even is happening in the in the US school system too. So um, I want to save plenty of time for questions or some time for questions. So I'll just wrap up with um, uh, a recommendation to if you haven't already checked out the Ameri American Association of University Women's report on women in STEM. It's 10 years old, but I have to say they have not updated it because the conclusions remain the same. The numbers do get are trickling better, and yet the the um, problems and the solutions are still um, very important to be discussing, such as enhancing the teaching of spatial skills early in the curriculum. We teach reading and writing. We don't teach spatial skills and addressing uh, the issue of uh, the chilly climate and sexual harassment. So I'll wrap up with some beautiful pictures from the AAUW report. Um, I tried to show you that sex, gender, sex and gender differences in behavior are real, but much smaller than the variance within gender. And I didn't get to show you, but they're not present.
I did take more time to say that sex differences in the brain are tiny and quite variable across populations. And there certainly are no differences in brain circuitry that explain any of the uh, behavioral differences between women, at least at this point. And what I hope you come away with is this understanding of the importance of development. That these gender differences in abilities, expressions, even our interests uh, are largely learned and uh, became, become ingrained through this embodied habit, social interaction and cultural. Thank you very much, Dr. Elliot. Um, I'd like to ask us all to <laughs> do a virtual uh, applause. I know this is such a difficult environment to try and have an interactive discussion in, um, but thank you very much for, for, your, um, for your talk today. Um, if any of you do have questions, please um, uh, put them in the Q&A. There are a couple of there, but I'm, I'm happy to entertain more. And of course I have a million of my own, but I don't want to uh, monopolize the Q and A. Um, let me start with um, one of the questions, you know, Lisa, you, you're be, even being a neuroscientist, I still set, study sex differences, right? And, and we are encouraged by places like the Nat National Institute of Health to include both males and females in our studies. Um, and I'm wondering now whether that in and of itself is adding to the bias um, that there already is in yeah, science broadly I, I, defined. I, I, so what do yeah. you think about that? I, I'm not a big fan of the SABV policy as it's called, sex as a biological variable, which the NIH put into effect in 2016, which I mean, um, human research has always required that uh, that clinical trials be fully representative of um, both by sex and by ethnicity and every other criterion age when possible. Now, that's not always easy to do. And there have been some cases where women have been understudied, uh, for example, I think in, in the cardiac field. But when it comes to the brain, if anything, there's been more studies of women's brains than men's brains, um, just because there's, you know, a lot of uh, psychiatric and neurologic MS and other diseases. So from a human standpoint, I fully agree. I mean, you need to study as diverse a population as possible because there may be covariates that we want to know about. But the, the argument that um, if we don't study everything in every whatever medical issue we're interested in, in both male and female rats and male and female mice we might be missing something important i think is way simplistic uh, a, a real lack of appreciation of the degree to which sex differences are very species specific even among mice uh, even among rats you'll find you know uh, one behavioral difference that is well characterized in one fish, you know, in, in fisher rats, but not in spray golly. Um, and, uh, and, you know, this idea of using rats and mice as a model for human psychiatric sex disparities. I mean, women are twice as likely to suffer from depression and anxiety. Well, it's the opposite in rats, <laughs> where males tend to be the more uh, fearful. So, um, I, like I said, I'm not, I think that by all means, there should be robust research on sex differences that, you know, there's been some interesting work that's come out uh, about the molecular mechanisms of pain processing. Um, but, um, and so in terms of exploratory science, I think it's important to, to, uh, to look at you know, hormones and, and all that. But I don't, I think mandating that everybody study this is a big waste of resources. And it's really just gonna churn out a lot of underpowered sex difference findings that um, are gonna muddy the works and eat up grant dollars. That's my view. <laughs> well, perhaps the mandate should also have a place to in, encourage um, publication of, of work that shows that there's not a difference and not reward the publication of work where there is a difference, right? So that may Absolutely. be a way to, to circumvent the bias. Yes, yes. Um, I want to go to one of the questions in our, our panel here. Um, Lauren Abels Torres asks, um, my father is a firm believer in human sexual dimorphism. Um, sorry, I lost my question here, sorry. Um, and female biological inferiority. 
So I wanted to ask you, what would you say to him or anyone like him to get him to question his beliefs and at least try to lessen his bias? Whew. Well, hopefully you will be his best example. Uh, men with daughters uh, tend to um, shift their view on feminism, at least to some degree. There was a great study on the Supreme Court that found that justices who had uh, daughters, their views tended to move more to the left, or at least in terms of uh, gender justice. Um, you know, that that is a tough one. Uh, I, I have similar experience with my own father. I think after many, many years, he's come, he's come around. You just got to keep showing them examples. But um, it it is a huge hurdle. We pay we we pay a tax for being women uh, in terms of our credibility. And, you know, they they say there's like Hillary Clinton already had four percentage points against her or six percentage points. You know, it's just a huge number because of these uh, assumptions that females are less competent. So um, uh, share my paper with them, uh, show them some bell curves of, of these differences. And, um, uh, you know, I suspect uh, you will be living proof and he will come around. Cause I think, I believe you're, if this was a student, um, it did take my dad another 10 or 15 years to, to believe me. Thank you, Lise. Um, a question from Dr. Bell asks, well, it starts off by saying, this is a loaded question that could require a long answer, but um, I wonder how you relate effects of circulating or local brain estrogens on neural function observed in animal models. So regulating stress responses, intracellular calcium signaling, et cetera, to human brain functions. Yeah, I... Um... I tried to follow the hormone studies for a while, but I just got overwhelmed. I mean, there is just so many studies and the effects go up and down and, you know, it's a function of whether they're stressed or whether they're not stressed or age. Um, I, I, so I really haven't followed it for animal studies. For human studies, I will say that there's been this incredible amount of effort to show that, you know, estrogen uh, loss at menopause is responsible for cognitive decline, and it has not held up. And in fact, as many of you probably know, the Women's Health Initiative of uh, providing estrogen replacement therapy uh, was a horrible failure. Um, and if anything, it, it uh, accelerated the onset of dementia. So, um, you know, it's I, I hear you that you know local effects of of, of steroid hormones are certainly present and powerful. Um, but, um, you know, I think that uh, finding a very specific effect in a rodent is not, to me, strong evidence that's that, that that's going to influence. I mean, the menstrual studies, there's been decades of uh, PhD students who threw up their hands after trying to uh, replicate these claims about menstrual fluctuations in cognitive and verbal skills, um, or ver cognitive, uh, verbal and spatial skills. So um, there's a lot of claims out there that, at least at the human behavioral level, I, I haven't found a hold up. I, I understand when you've got cells in addition, you can squirt on a transmitter, you can, uh, or hormone, you can often see dramatic effects. Thank you. Um, I think we have time for maybe one more question. Um, this is from Caleb uh, Bayou. I apologize if I did not say your name properly. Um, Caleb asked, well, there's two questions, but I think we may only have time for one. What's the best argument you've heard from proponents of gender differences? And I'll add, what was your um, response or rebuttal to it? Um, proponents of brain brain gender, brain sex differences, mm -hmm. I presume? Yeah. I'm well, assuming. to be honest, I was really thrown for a loop when these multivariate studies came along and uh, people were able to, are able to um, classify a anonymous brain as male or female based on these, you know, huge data sets and artificial intelligence. But 
then once I realized that um, they weren't prop properly controlling for brain size, um, you know, I, I feel less threatened by that. I mean, to me, the strongest argument is just, look, behavior is different. There is no question. We have very reliable behavioral differences. But I didn't show you, but there was a study of uh, eight-year-olds that showed that girls already are less uh, assertive in negotiation, especially when they're negotiating with a male with a with a male teacher versus a female teacher, they they uh, they don't get the most that they could, whereas the boys get better and better as they get older. Um, so we have these behavioral differences. It's got to be somewhere in the brain. I cannot deny. And so I do think you know, um, at some point it is uh, certainly possible if our imaging resolution gets better and we can control the noise and have really huge populations that we will pick up circuit level. Uh, differences. We have to. There has to be something underlying these behaviors. But um, we also know there's a tremendous amount of individual variation. And so uh, it, it looks like it's going to be pretty hard to pick this, the sex signal from the individual noise uh, at, for a long time. Thank you. And I'm watching time. And I think we unfortunately have to uh, stop the Q&A session at this point in time. But this was really a enlightening conversation, um, very fascinating work. And kudos to you for continuing. You have done this work for a very long time in terms of trying to demonstrate that that the brains of males and females are not as different as we think they are. And, and I Thank you for continuing to, to <laughs> beat, that, beat that drum. So thank you very, very much. Um, at this point in time, I would like to um, introduce uh, Dr. Susan McMahon, who will have a few concluding statements. Um, sorry, I guess I have to introduce Susan and not just say I'm going to, right? So <laughs> Dr. Susan McMahon is a Vincent DePaul professor of psychology and the associate dean for research um, in the College of Science and Health. And she's currently the director of the CSH's 10th anniversary celebration of events. So please join me in welcoming Susan for our closing remarks. Women have made exceptional contributions to science and their success has increased over time. There've been many barriers and as people have fought for equal rights and barriers have diminished, these accomplishments continue to grow. I resonated with the many messages that have been communicated tonight, such as breaking the glass ceiling, women accomplishing whatever they set their mind to, and with the science that Dr. Elliott presented. It is a pleasure to foster opportunities for women in science, recognize the contributions and provide scholarships, and for the DePaul College of Science and Health to host an annual lecture celebrating women in science. Thank you to Lise for your wonderful enlightening presentation, to Jingjing Jing and the committee for organizing this event, and to Linda for honoring her father through this event to celebrate and honor women. We hope you can join us for more CSH 10th anniversary events over the next few months, as well as this event celebrating women next year. So thank you so much and have a wonderful evening.